Jack Parsons to me is the greatest unknown uh, uh, I don't know what to call him the philosopher scientist uh, whatever he was he was the greatest he was one of the greatest men of the 20th century who's not known most people have heard of Buckminster Fuller and Albert Einstein and Alistair Crowley to some extent uh, or James Joyce Jack Parsons is virtually unknown and yet he was more than anybody else responsible for the American space program and the fact that a man as uh, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon he's responsible for the whole space program and he was one of the greatest libertarian philosophers who ever lived his book freedom is a two-edged sword seems to me one of the greatest statements of libertarian philosophy ever written and if I had a million dollars, I would print uh, enough copies of that to put one in every home in the United States so uh, that everybody would have a chance to read it. Uh, I'm, I'm a very ardent libertarian myself, but I disagree with most libertarians about a lot of issues. Jack Parsons is the one libertarian I agree with about almost everything in the 20th century. There are some 19th century libertarians I agree with about almost everything, such as Lysander Spooner, Ezra Haywood, Benjamin Tucker, but they're almost all forgotten, like Jack Parsons. Libertarianism does not have much popularity, although this country was founded on libertarian principles. Uh, Jack Parsons was not only a great libertarian philosopher and a great scientist, but he was a very gifted and talented and philosophical and intelligent occultist which is hard for a lot of people to understand most people think you're either a scientist or an occultist you can't be both Jack Parsons is the classic example of that you can be both there are many other cases in history like Isaac Newton Giordano Bruno Johannes Kepler but Parsons was the only one in recent times who was undoubtedly a major scientist, or at least a major engineer, which meant that he had to have a lot of basic scientific knowledge to be such a great engineer, and a major practicing occultist. And so the fact that he was a scientist, an occultist, and a libertarian makes him a tremendously fascinating and important figure. And the reason he's not generally known is because most people can't understand how you can put science, libertarianism, and occultism together in one head. And that's why Jack Parsons is so important. He did it, and, uh, and he was probably murdered by the United States government just because of that. Either that or he died in an accident, depending on whose story you believe. Well, the separation between science and occultism is a fairly modern thing. In the Renaissance, science and occultism were very closely related. As I mentioned, Kepler and Newton and practically everybody else who was important in the creation of the scientific revolution was also a practicing occultist. The outstanding example is Giordano Bruno, who was burned by the Catholic Church, burned at the stake on February 16th, 1600 in Rome. Bruno was uh, charged with 18 counts of heresy, and including practicing magic uh, and uh, teaching the Copernican theory of astronomy and uh, founding secret societies to oppose the Vatican. Uh, Francis Yates, a leading historian about Rodeba, who uh, her major topic was the birth of the modern scientific worldview, in the Renaissance, she thinks Bruno may have founded either Freemasonry or Rosicrucianism, or maybe both of them. And in that tradition, uh, Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati, is another uh, person in that tradition, and Alistair Crowley is another. He was Parsons' major teacher. The, the general view is that science is based on experiment, and occultism is based on woozy thinking and blind faith but the kind of occultism that the western world has produced through from the renaissance to the present has been based on uh, the same principles as science it's based on very simple things you do this and you observe the result uh, it's just like science it's just the same thing as scientific experiment you sit in a certain posture 
and try to empty your mind and see what happens. You change your posture and use a mantra instead of trying to empty your mind. You just keep repeating over and over. Om Namu Shivaya, Om Om Namu Shivaya, Om, or whatever the hell you want, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, or whatever you want. My favorite is Shamadi Shawadi, Shamadi Shawadi, Shamadi Shamadi, Shamadi Shawadi. It's like a windshield wiper, but it really empties the mind pretty quickly. Shamadi Shawadi, Shamadi Shawadi, Shamadi Shamadi, Shamadi Shawadi. Uh, magic in the Western occult sense is a whole bunch of tricks and devices, clever means, as they say in Hinduism, uh, clever means to mutate your consciousness by blocking the usual paths your consciousness goes in. Ordinary consciousness is a conditioned response to early uh, childhood experiences and early conditioning and early uh, learning and so on, which is why the children of most Catholics remain Catholics, the children of most communists remain communists, the children of most Muslim fundamentalists remain Muslim fundamentalists, etc., etc., etc. If you want to break out of the robotic conditioning imposed on you in childhood, you need some kind of dramatic technique. And uh, Western occultism is one of the more dramatic techniques of busting out of conditioned consciousness to become aware of the many levels of reality that you can perceive if you're not trapped in one particular reality tunnel. Uh, Parsons understood Crowley very well. Another American scientist who suffered as much uh, misrepresentation or just plain being ignored by the mass media. Timothy Leary also understood the importance of Crowley. Uh, Leary's work is very much in the same tradition as Crowley and Parsons. You do certain things and you observe the result and you see what conclusions you can obtain from that. Crowley, Parsons, and Leary both used uh, consciousness altering drugs to a great extent. That is considered the major crime in modern America for reasons that go back to the witchcraft persecutions. The Joan of Arc was burned at the stake for using drugs to contact uh, superior intelligences, which she called angels. The Catholic Church called them demons. Whatever the hell they were, they told how to unite France and drive the English out. Uh, she used marijuana. It's very interesting that people are in jail all over this country for the same crime that Joan of Arc was burned at the stake for, isn't it? Jack Parsons was probably killed by the American government for using the same techniques of altering consciousness. I think uh, Crowley's techniques, uh, Crowley's magazine, The Equinox, had the uh, masthead, uh, uh, the magazine of scientific illuminism, and the importance of the scientific method in the Crowley system is not generally understood. Most people just know that Crowley detested organized religion. They know he hated Christianity. They don't know he hated every other organized religion, too, and was very careful not to found one of his own. There are no Crowleyans, or anybody who thinks they're a Crowleyan doesn't understand Crowley. There is no Crowley in religion. As far as there's a Crowleyan movement, it's called, uh, they call themselves Thelemites rather than Crowleyans because they don't want to build Crowley up into an idol, which was the last thing he wanted. What he wanted was for people to use his methods to discover the truth of their own inner nature, which is different for every person. That's the meaning of Crowley's mantra, every man and every woman is a star. You gotta find the star within yourself. And Parsons found the star within himself and that allowed him to be tremendously creative. When nobody else Except Godard. Godard, Goddard, I mean. I, I was uh, getting Goddard confused with the French movie director. And since Goddard was an American, it would be pronounced Goddard, wouldn't it? Uh, Goddard was the only one besides Jack Parsons who realized the potentials of space travel and the fact that we could do it in this century. Parsons was uh, a lot more creative than Godard and uh, his work. Well, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena was not only founded by Parsons, but some people claim the initials were deliberately picked to have his initials in them, Jack Parsons, JPL. And the Aerojet 
corporation which he created makes the solid fuels used in all of our moon uh, launchings, our shuttles. The, the, whole, the whole space program really depends on Jack Parsons. That's why he has a crater on the moon named after him. Now, he couldn't have made those breakthroughs without getting out of Hell, when I was young, I remember adults telling me when I was a teenager, what are you reading that science fiction crap for? Yeah, that stuff is all impossible. But I was going to a technical high school, and I knew that it was all possible. I didn't know how soon, but I knew it would be possible someday, so I was fascinated by it. Jack Parsons had the visions to say, hey, it's possible right now. We just got to put our money and our energy into it, and we can do it. And by the time he died, uh, there, there were rockets all over the damn place. And we were, uh, he died in 52, and in 69, the first man walked on the moon. If Parsons had lived longer, he would have made even more contributions to space science. I don't know uh, what turned Parsons on to Crowley originally. I have a few guesses. It could have been Lieber Oz which Crowley wrote because somebody complained that his books were too hard to understand. So he wrote a one-page summary of all of his ideas in which almost every word is one syllable. There are a couple of two-syllable words in it, but most of it is one word, one-syllable words. It begins, do what thou will shall be the whole of the law, which is all one syllables. And it goes on, man has the right to live as he will, to love as he will, to create art as he will, to create science as he will, to dress as he will, and it goes on like that. Uh, mostly, as I said, one syllable words. That might have been what turned Parsons on. Or well, maybe it was uh, book four, which is the most rational uh, scientific account of mysticism ever written. Crowley begins by saying we live in a world in which there's a lot of suffering. The first thing we notice is the amount of suffering that we endure and the amount of suffering going on around us. So the major question of philosophy is how can we escape suffering? And then he describes yoga step by step as a series of techniques for abolishing suffering by detaching yourself from mechanical conditioned reactions within the nervous system. And then he goes on to explain magic as a series of techniques to make yoga work faster. That could have appealed very much to somebody with a background like Parsons. And then again, maybe it was just one of uh, Crowley's, uh, maybe it was Crowley's, uh, one of Crowley's novels like Diary of a Dope Fiend, which might have appealed to somebody with a chemical background. I got interested in psychedelics because of a conservative philosopher named Russell Kirk who in one of his books mentioned Aldous Huxley's experiments with uh, mescaline and said this proved the existence of heaven and hell. I wasn't sure it proved the existence of heaven and hell, but what I observed was that it showed that consciousness depends on the chemistry of the brain. And uh, that's what got me interested in psychedelic research because uh, the idea that consciousness depends on the chemistry of the brain is a natural thought to me. I had a kind of sci I had basically a scientific education to start with. And so that could have appealed very much to Parsons with his background. But however, again, interested in Crowley, Crowley was like a key that opened a lock, a lot of locks for Jack Parsons. The idea that uh, the Crowley system is black magic derives from a lot of fundamental misunderstandings. The only possible intelligent definition of black magic is using psychic power to harm people, putting curses on people, trying to make them sick, trying to kill them, sticking pins in voodoo dolls, that kind of thing. That has nothing to do with Crowley's system. The Crowley system is considered black magic by fundamentalists and uh, people of that ilk because it's uh, entirely devoid of uh, Christian emphasis. It's uh, ecumenical. It includes Taoism, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, and uh, it includes Christianity too, although Crowley tried to hide that as he got older because he got more and more hostile to Christianity. But if you do some of Crowley's rituals, you'll get a deeper understanding of what the mystical level of Christianity 
I got my deepest insight into Christ uh, the symbolism of the crucifixion doing a Crowley ritual. Um, it includes the world, all the religions of the world, but it's not limited to any one of them. And the fundamentalist, that is the great satanic blasphemy, not putting Christianity above all other religions. The, uh, the New Age, so the reason they're so hostile to the New Age is it doesn't say Christianity is the one true path. The New Age says learn from all the religions. That's what Crowley was saying, too, except he didn't like religions. He was saying learn from all the practices. Don't accept any of the dogmas, but try the practices and see where they get you. Try meditating, try praying, try yoga, try uh, drugs, try everything that's, uh, try the, everything that shamans and wizards and yogis have been doing from the dawn of history and see where it gets you. And use scientific uh, skepticism about the results. Crowley never believed any of the supernatural, pardon me, uh, the supernatural <laughs> entities he contacted. He, he realized that they were all projections of parts of himself, and so he learned from them what you can, but don't believe everything they tell you. Some of them are liars. That's a very central part of Crowley's teachings, and Parsons understood that, too. Parsons got involved in this idea of the moon child from one of Crowley's novels, and the idea is to uh, create a... Uh, an infant who will be born all through the nine months of pregnancy there will be all these magical and uh, magical in quotes and uh, other uh, influences to separate the child from normal earthly influences and make them more compatible with life in outer space because uh, Parsons saw the future of humanity as being in outer space and he wanted to create a child who would be equipped to live in outer space. Well, since then, we found out that going into outer space creates a mutation in consciousness anyway. Eighty-five percent of the American astronauts and the Soviet cosmonauts have all had, mystic, quote, mystical experiences. People who go into zero gravity uh, experience the same kind of change in consciousness that you get on marijuana or hashish. This is only one of the many higher levels of consciousness. Uh, it's, not, it's nothing like LSD or the psychedelics, but it's a definite mutation in consciousness. And Parsons was trying to create a child who would be born with that kind of consciousness and would never be dragged down by the... Uh, I can't help quoting Timothy Leary again. Gravity is the enemy, levity is the salvation levitate, go, go higher, don't, don't get pulled down, don't get dragged down, don't be too grave, don't be too serious. And uh, Parsons understood that. We're, it's time for us to get used to outer space. And it's happening, uh, whether Parsons was responsible or not. I, uh, some people think uh, his Mojave Venus working uh, was not completed properly, and that's why we're having all these weird UFO uh, phenomena. Whether that's true or not, we are getting ready for outer space by the, just by the simple fact that so many millions of people believe they've had outer space contacts already. They're turning into moon children in the Parsons sense. And of course, those who have very rigid belief systems find it absolutely terrifying. And all they can remember is that they were raped by little green monsters from outer space. Well, that's not quite what happened, I don't, in my opinion. But it's uh, the only sense they can make out of this kind of experience of encountering extraterrestrial intelligence. As Jodie Foster, uh, the scriptwriter, or whoever says in Contact, it's, if, the, if we're the only intelligent beings in a universe this size, that's an awful waste of space. <laughs> Parsons' uh, major uh, occult uh, educational uh, background came through the Auto Templi Orientis which was founded uh, or revived or whatever there were in these subjects there are always alternative versions of what happened but sometime in the 1890s a couple of uh, german freemasons named carl kellner and theodore royce decided to create a masonic academy which would uh, be a 
kind of central office in which all the different Masonic traditions could be rationalized, uh, synthesized, and the differences between various orders of Freemasonry could be abolished. Well, what they created didn't satisfy any of the different schools of Freemasonry and uh, did not become a Masonic Academy, so they changed its name to the Auto Templi Orientis. And it was their idea of what was the most sound and important and the revolutionary aspects of Freemasonry. And they got a lot of disciples all over Europe and some in England. One of them was uh, Wynne Westcott, who was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a Rosicrucian society in England in which Crowley got his early education in occultism. And in 1912, approximately, uh, Theodore Royce came to Crowley and told him You've written a book in which you reveal the secret of the ninth degree of the Auto Templi Orientis. Why have you done that? And Crowley said, I don't know any. I, I didn't reveal any secret of the ninth degree because I don't know what, what that is. And where he said, well, you've published it very clearly. And he showed him the chapter in a book of Crowley's with the humorous title, The Book of Lies, falsely so called, which is a wonderful title because of the book, the title the sub the title tells you it's a book of lies. The subtitle tells you it's not a book of lies. And you got to figure out which whether to believe the title or the subtitle. And when Crowley looked at the chapter Roy showed him, he realized suddenly he had been a 33rd degree Freemason at that point already. He suddenly realized that the Auto Templi Orientis really did have what was the most central and important part of Freemasonry. So he accepted the ninth degree, and when Royce died, he appointed Crowley to the tenth degree, which is the outer head of the Auto Templi Orientis. And uh, the Auto Templi Orientis ever since then has been uh, pretty much under Crowley's influence one way, to some degree or another. And uh, anybody who wants to find out the central secret of uh, what Freemasonry, Illuminism, Rosicrucianism, and all the occult traditions of the West, uh, alchemy, what they were all about, Crowley tells you quite cl quite clearly. It's in one of the chapters of the Book of Lies. All you got to do is decide which chapter it is and decipher it. I think that uh, Parsons' uh, work in the Crowley system, which, as I s mentioned, uh, Crowley calls scientific Illuminism. It's very important to note the adjective as well as the noun, scientific Illuminism. That's uh, Crowley majored in organic chemistry in, at Cambridge. And uh, Parsons was basically a chemist before he was an, even an engineer. Uh, the um, The Crowleyan system is particularly uh, valuable to creative people, whether in sciences or the arts. Parsons wasn't the only uh, student of Crowley that made major contributions. J. W. N. Sullivan was a major mathematician who wrote absolutely the most brilliant book on Beethoven that anybody has ever written. He was able to make the jump from mathematics to music and to write a really brilliant book about music. There was another mathematician who was, uh, that was Norman Mudd of Cambridge. And uh, I think uh, to, to a great extent, uh, the whole psychedelic revolution was heavily influenced by Crowley, uh, which is why the government is trying so hard to destroy any record of it. There's hardly anybody alive in the 1990s who uh, has read the literature of LSD research when it was legal. When LSD research was legal, there was one report after another of absolutely astonishing results. Uh, Timothy Leary, the archdemon of all of them, he reversed the recidivism rate of criminals in the Massachusetts uh, prison system. The average is that 90% uh, of all released convicts are back in jail within one year. In Leary's uh, therapy uh, group, uh, using psychedelic drugs and uh, mystical uh, readings, 90% of them were still out uh, on the streets after one year instead of being back in prison. He entirely reversed the usual pattern. The, uh, there were um, 
they were curing schizophrenics with LSD. People found they could learn languages much quicker with LSD than they could with any other technique. They cured alcoholics. It's astonishing how many uh, successful scientific reports there were on LSD before the government made it illegal. Ali has always appealed to me because he stands out among all the great mystics of, of, the, of the world in being the most egregious case. Uh, the, the, there are some pretty weird mystics in all traditions and some that look like they were apartheid crazy. But there's nobody quite compares to Crowley. Uh, Mary uh, Daste Sturgis, who was Crowley's mistress around 1911 and wrote the introduction to his book four, she said other religious leaders say, believe me. Crowley says, don't believe me. Now, that's what I find most attractive about him is his constant uh, skepticism. And uh, don't, don't believe me. Uh, try uh, the exercises and find out for yourself. He uh, studied uh, most of the schools of uh, consciousness alteration that existed in his time. He studied yoga with the Hindus and the Buddhists and various different types of yoga, Hatha yoga, Gnani yoga, Raja yoga, Tantra yoga. He, he learned a lot about Taoism in China, when he became an I Ching expert long before there were any others in the Western world who knew anything about I Ching. Did his own translation of the Tao Te Ching. Studied a little Sufism in North Africa, evidently. He was a, the leading authority in his time in Western, uh, the Western occult tradition. And he picked up bits and snatches of all sorts of other things in his travels around the world, uh, including a great deal about uh, shamanic traditions that use drugs to alter consciousness. Uh, he, he knew more about that than anybody before the 1960s. Uh, so all in all, uh, uh, reading Crowley's books, you, you, he gives you, in uh, most of his books, he gives you a lot of exercises uh, along with the theory. And if you start doing the exercises that Crowley gives you, you find your consciousness does alter. And then you find the universe alters, which, of course, is inevitable because the only universe you know is the universe in your consciousness. So this is kind of confusing to some people. But uh, this combination of do the work and uh, don't, uh, don't uh, believe anybody's dog must draw your own conclusions after you've done the work. I, I like that approach. Crowley put it into a poem once, uh, which I'm fond of. We place no reliance on virgin or pigeon. Our method is science. Our aim is religion. I think that's a terrific approach. Especially when you look around at so many things that are called New Age that are so gullible and uh, uh, medieval. The uh, uh, people who uh, you feel you could easily sell them the Brooklyn Bridge if you were inclined. They, 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 they'd go and get the savings out of the bank and hand it to you right away. Uh, compared to the gullibility and superstition in uh, most New Age centers, Crowley is really refreshing, like cold water in the face, really wakes you up. And there's a lot of interesting uh, stories about Crowley, uh, and I don't think there is yet a really good uh, biography of Crowley. They're all... Uh, they're all biased. Most of them are biased against him. The, his men and enemies got into print before his friends. And there, there are several books that portray Crowley as a raving monster and a uh, uh, demented uh, maniac uh, sadist and whatnot. And uh, then his friends or admirers started writing biographies that are equally prejudiced and try to portray him as 
of the magus of the new aeon, the, the uh, order of the word of the law, which will transform the whole planet to higher consciousness at some time in the very near future. We are supposed to have entered, according to the orthodox Proleans, we are supposed to have entered the Aeon of Horus in 1904. And uh, if you ask, what is the evidence? Well, uh, the world certainly has gotten a lot weirder since 1904. <laughs> Uh, when the Aeon of Horus fully manifests itself is an open question. Is it going to take 500 years or is it going to happen in, a, in 2012 like everybody else's prophecies? Well, I don't know. But uh, meanwhile, we've got all this literature about Crowley, some of it absolutely incredible. I, one of the most widely uh, published uh, stories about Crowley is the time uh, he and his son McGregor uh, went into a hotel room in Paris and drew a pentagram and invoked the devil. And in the morning, McGregor was found dead of a heart attack and Crowley was off his head and had to spend six months in a mental hospital and never quite regained his intellectual faculties. That story has appeared in quite a few books. The fascinating thing about it is it first appeared in a work of fiction, a novel, by Dennis Wheatley. Dennis Wheatley was the head of the Double Cross Bureau of English Intelligence. Crowley was a part-time employee of MI5. Uh, each one of them uh, seemed to have been highly suspicious of the other. Wheatley had a tendency to believe that any conspiracy he wasn't supervising personally was the work of the devil. And, uh, well, the Double Cross Bureau had some real weirdos in it anyway. It was a, besides Wheatley, Ian Fleming worked in the Double Cross Bureau. You see what kind of rich fantasy life he had when you read the James Bond novels. And Alan Turing, who invented the Turing machine uh, problem, also worked there. Anyway, Wheatley's invention uh, in, in the novel called for the devil a bride about Crowley and his son invoking the devil. There are lots of weaknesses in this story. Uh, for instance, Crowley never spent any time in a mental hospital in France. And for another thing, his son McGregor never showed any interest in magic or in Crowley's occult studies. And for a third thing, uh, McGregor Crowley didn't uh, didn't die of a heart attack in a hotel room in Paris. And uh, the most clinching argument of all is uh, there was there never was a, a son named McGregor Crowley. The whole thing was made up out of a whole cloth. There's not one fact in that. Now, that's typical of a lot of the legends about Crowley. Once you start examining them, you find out <laughs> they were created either by Crowley out of his wicked sense of humor or by his enemies out of their total lack of humor. And uh, it's very hard to find out what to believe. Uh, I didn't. Uh, it took me a long time to decide whether or not to believe he worked for English intelligence. But the, the evidence has accumulated enough that I believe that. Although it sounds like something he might have invented, he did invent some pretty tall tales about himself. Crowley evidently worked in the propaganda division. Among other things, he uh, proposed the sign that's identified with Winston Churchill, the V for Victory sign, which is why invoking the powers of uh, Seth, uh, uh, the Egyptian. Uh, donkey-headed deity that uh, Crowley regarded as uh, a good mischievous spirit to set against your enemies. Uh, Crowley did various other things for English intelligence. All the details are far from clear. Crowley's uh, <laughs> psychic and uh, propaganda war with McGregor Matthews was real, uh, was typical of the kookiness of the occult world. Um, 
And Greg and Mathers arose to the position of outer head of the Golden Dawn, which was the primary magical order in England at that time. The Yates and several others decided Mathers had become a tyrant and perhaps a megalomaniac. Uh, they unseated him and formed a rival Golden Dawn, claiming he was unfit to lead. Uh, Crowley sided with Mathers and uh, Yates developed the opinion that Crowley had set demons upon him because of his rebellion against Mathers. Uh, then uh, Crowley and Mathers had a quarrel, and they uh, each accused the other of setting demons upon them. Uh, but they finally got to court because Crowley and his magazine, Equinox, started publishing all the secret rituals of the Golden Dawn. He announced that the secret chiefs had authorized them to do this. This is the kind of thing that cannot be judged in the court of law because the secret chiefs did not take the form uh, in space-time where they can testify in the courtroom. The secret chiefs exist uh, only uh, where the square root of minus one exists, uh, the white rabbit of Alice in Wonderland. You, you've got to be in a special state to contact the secret chiefs of no court is quite equipped to do it. So if one guy says, the secret chiefs told me this, and somebody else said, the secret chiefs told me the opposite, there's no evidential way of judging between them. You just decide uh, which one you think is crazier than the other. So anyway, Crowley uh, claimed the secret chiefs authorized him to publish these rituals. Mathers tried to stop it. Uh, the trial turned into uh, all sorts of irrelevant issues such as whether Mathers had or had not alleged that he was the reincarnation of King Charles I, uh, which Mathers didn't want to answer on the witness stand for fear of prejudicing the jury, but was compelled to admit he had at times claimed to be the reincarnation of Charles I. There wasn't Charles II, I think. Uh, and uh, there were various innuendos about Crowley's sex life, which Crowley enjoyed very much, although most of the other people <laughs> did not enjoy it. Uh, Crowley really uh, had a, a weak uh, spot for, um, he didn't mind how much trouble he got into or how much pain he caused uh, those around him. But he had a chance to do something that would shock the British public. He'd go ahead and do it. And, uh, uh, the most amazing thing about his life is that he stayed out of jail. He lived to be 72 and never spent a day in jail. It's amazing for a person with his temperament. Everybody I know who remotely reminds me of Crowley is spent time in jail. You can't have that attitude of uh, deliberately flaunting society's rules. I think Sinead O'Connor is going to end up in jail eventually for instance. Uh, Crowley was sort of a cross between Sinead O'Connor and uh, uh, Madonna in, in a male form. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, that's, that's another of the interesting Crowley legends. Uh, Crowley predicted uh, he, uh, he would reincarnate to carry on the work of initiating the new Aeon. I mean, when he came back, it would be as a woman. And you'd be surprised how many women I've met who claim they are Crowley reincarnated. Uh, it's a long, long list. Uh, the one I find most plausible has never made the claim. That's Madonna. She she has her own shtick. She doesn't need the claim to be Crowley. <laughs> She's got a big enough audience already. The most fascinating uh, to me of the occult side of Crowley. Uh, there's, there's many sides to Crowley. You can, tell, you can look at Crowley entirely as a linguistic philosopher uh, in the tradition of Wittgenstein that went even further than Wittgenstein. There's a book called Portable Darkness, an anthology of Crowley's writings, which the editor pretty much interprets Crowley as a linguistic philosopher chiefly and makes everything else secondary. But if you do want to look into, uh, there's many ways of looking at Crowley. I like to look at him as a scientist in the consciousness alteration field. 
a pioneer, a forerunner of Tim Leary and Stan Graf and uh, John Lilly and all the great consciousness researchers of the last 30 years. Holy was 50 years ahead of everybody else. But uh, on the occult side, the, uh, the most fascinating uh, thing is the Book of the Law, which Crowley was, first of all, one of the most notorious practical jokers of his time. He was responsible for numerous hoaxes. It's very difficult to tell when he's kidding and when he's serious. His books are all written. That's part of his way of keeping you on the key V, making it arousing curiosity so you will try the experiments and uh, also keeping you from just accepting things as dogma. He's constantly playing games in his style. Is this serious or is this another of his jokes? And he did perform some outstanding hoaxes. One of the most famous was the Hail Mary hoax, which was a book of hymns to the Blessed Virgin, allegedly written by a nun, it turned out to be written by Aleister Crowley. And he explained after the hoax was revealed that he wrote the poems to Isis, but he thought since the Virgin Mary is just the modern version of Isis, it could be just as easily presented that way and would have a bigger audience. And he, he was, there were lots of fascinating hoaxes that he was involved in. And then there's the Book of the Law, which is allegedly a communication from higher intelligence about which Crowley was very cryptic. He said he got it from his holy guardian angel. He told one disciple, the holy guardian angel is not in any sense your higher self, uh, like, the the like in theosophy and a lot of occult movements. It's a separate being of much higher intelligence than a human. He told another disciple, the holy guardian angel was just a metaphor for your own unconscious. So he directly contradicted himself, depending on who he was talking to. The, um, the, and he was a well-known hoaxer. Nonetheless, everything he ever wrote about the Book of the Law, he insisted he was serious this time. He was not hoaxing. Of course, the best hoaxes all begin that way. I'm not performing a hoax this time. I'm being serious. He insists the Book of the Law is a revelation from higher intelligence. It's not a hoax, and that he has suffered throughout his whole life from the duty to speak the truth as revealed in this book, no matter how much trouble it made for him. And that uh, is, I suppose, the first, the major koan and Crowley, uh, Crowley's uh, a system uh, which is called Thelema. He didn't want it named after himself. He was terrified that he'd come back in 2,000 years and find Crowleyanity had become as reactionary as Christianity. So he insisted on it being called Thelema, so at least uh, he was named would not be disgraced, whatever his disciples did with the movement. And uh, in the, in the Thelemic system, there are koans, just as in Zen Buddhism. There are points in Zen, you're studying Zen, you're, the Roshi gives you a koan to work on, a riddle like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Or who is the master who makes the grass green? Akoli has koans built into his system, and I presented as koans. They you just run into them, and you suddenly stop. And what am I going to do about this? What, am I going to believe him? Am I going to think it's a joke? Is there a hidden meaning? And the big koan is: uh, Do you believe in the Book of the Law, or is it just the one joke that he kept a straight face about for most of his life? And uh, it's fascinating how different people react to that. Uh, I find it fa I find it fascinating because the book of the law does seem uh, it's uh, it's just spooky enough to keep you guessing where it came from. Israel Rigardi, who studied with Crowley in the twenties and later became a Reiki and psychotherapist in Los Angeles, Rigardi suggests that Crowley had nine personalities at various levels of the psyche and. Uh, the deepest level was uh, he gives names to these in terms of all these magical titles and the deepest level was Awas which uh, is not only 
the deepest level of Crowley's unconscious, if I understand this. It's the deepest level of the human psyche. It is the collective mind of humanity. And that was speaking through the Book of the Law, according to Rigardi's interpretation. And the Book of Lies is one of my favorites of Crowley's books. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say which is weirder and funnier and more mysterious, the Book of the Law or the Book of Lies. I guess the Book of the Law has more perpetual shock in it. Uh, every time you go back to it, you get shocked again and shook up a little bit more. The Book of Lies is a lot funnier, uh, but it requires careful study. It's got so many different kinds of jokes in it. Every chapter, the number of the chapter is important. There are capitalistic jokes about the number of the chapter in every chapter. There are jokes within jokes and anagrams and acrostics and every conceivable way of saying ten things at the same time and keeping you confused about which ones are serious and which ones are jokes and is, is there a difference and uh, many times uh, you'll find the passage where the surface meaning is conventionally religious well, not, not, not in the ordinary sense conventionally mystic it could be Lao Tzu or Buddha or uh, some Sufi, it could be any great mystic. And then you suddenly discover there's a dirty joke hidden under that. And you think, boy, what a mixed up mind he had. He was a real weird, what a weird sense of humor. And then you find the dirty joke has behind that an allegory, which takes you back to the mystical level again. And then you find out you can interpret it in terms of uh, Freudian or Jungian psychology, and that Crowley obviously understood that and wanted you to see that. Then you wonder how many more levels you can find. And it gets funnier and funnier. Uh, it sounds very, it is very intellectual, but it's very funny, too. It's, a, it's very intellectual humor. Like uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, Mathematical Logic, in which he proves some dowagers are thistles. Uh, he, has a, he has a perfectly logical proof of that. And, uh, the Book of Lies uh, is uh, that kind of humor. Uh, the, he, he even wrote a commentary on it, which is even funnier. A commentary in one place, uh, he talks about some of the logical errors he committed in that chapter, deliberately violating the rules of logic just to confuse the people further. And he says, but to, after listening to errors in logic, he says, but to explain this further would set the book beyond the understanding of the common reader in Oshkosh for whom I am writing. Uh, plus, the common person in Oshkosh is not going to understand more than three lines of this book. I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I, I place it uh, pretty much in the same general area as Finnegan's Wake. It's not as great as an artistic achievement as Finnegan's Wake, but it's equally funny and equally inexhaustible and uh, the more you dive into it, the more you find. You can go on for years and years, just like with Finnegan's Wake, finding more and more meanings and more and more jokes. Get a whole of uh, Magic, which is three parts of book four. And don't ask me why the publisher left out the fourth part. The doings of publishers are even more mysterious than the doings of magicians. I think the publisher is Samuel Weiser. I'm, well, I'm not sure of that. But anyway, Magic uh, has uh, the book four with, is, has four parts. Magic, uh, Magic and Yoga. Uh, no, wait a minute. Yoga, Yoga and Magic, Magic, and Philosophical Commentaries on the Book of the Law. And the book called Magic consists of the first three. And it's full of exercises. Uh, so the more confused you get by Crowley, the, the more motive you have for trying the exercises. And if you try the exercises, it's absolutely guaranteed that you'll get more confused. Uh, but you'll also begin to see light where you never saw it before. The world becomes, as Crowley says, a continuous ceremony of initiation.
This is the one area where the rationalist approach to history absolutely breaks down. If you try to find out the truth about any of these magical societies that Crowley was involved with, especially the Golden Dawn, the Auto Templi Orientis, the Illuminati, uh, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, and uh, about, <laughs> about 20 or 30 others of less importance that he was involved in at one time or other. Every one of them, you, uh, the, the trail uh, disappears into fog. Beyond a certain point, everything becomes uncertain and mysterious. It's like the intrusion into this world of another world. Zelfus Levy uh, seems to be the enemy of the kind of occultism that Crowley uh, was involved in. Crowley translated one of Levy's books and always spoke highly of Levy, praised them to the skies. Eliphas Levy wasn't Jewish, by the way. That was a pen name. He was actually a Roman Catholic mystic. But his uh, Crowley despised the Catholic Church even more than Sinead O'Connor does. Crowley, when Crowley refers to the Black Brothers, uh, the doers of evil who have set a spell over mankind to put us in slavery, he means the Roman Catholic Church. It takes a while to decipher that one, but Crowley was one of the leading anti-Catholic uh, uh, revolutionaries of the last couple of centuries. And yet here he is uh, uh, in the same party with this Roman Catholic mystic who wrote under a Jewish name. But that's the way it was. The magical world is full of these mysteries and paradoxes and false fronts. And uh, um, John Dee um, was Queen Elizabeth's astrologer and a great mathematician. And uh, he got some fragments in a language which uh, several uh, linguists claim is a real language, not just gibble gabble or made up or pretense. It's a real language, but it's not a human language. And uh, the D was D bright enough to invent the language, but maybe he was. But it turns out a century before him, another magician named Pico della Mirandola in Italy. I uh, got a few other fragments in that language. And of course, in the Golden Dawn, Crowley learned to use that language, which is supposed to allow you to converse with angels, Anakian spirits. Grady McMurtry, who was the caliph of the Auto Templi Orientis until his death a few years ago, he told me he asked Crowley once when it was safe to summon the Anakian spirits, and Crowley said, you don't have to summon them. When you are ready, they come for you. Uh, the Order uh, Templi Orientis and the Golden Dawn are officially uh, very opposed to each other, and yet I, without mentioning names, I don't want to give away too much, I, I know somebody who's the leader of one branch of the Golden Dawn and a member of the Auto Dumpli Orientis. There are at least three branches of the Golden Dawn in California, each of them denouncing the others as bogus. Then there's the new reformed Orthodox Order of the Golden Dawn, which doesn't claim to be genuine at all. And then there's the fake Sufi school, by the way. There, you know how many orders of Sufis there are running around California all claiming we're the true Sufis, the others are all fakes? Well, there's a group called the fake Sufi school up in Nevada City for the fake Sufis. But the 666 thing, uh, yeah, a very early poem he has these lines, by all sorts of monkey tricks they make my name mean 666. Well, I will deserve it if I can. It is the number of a man. So apparently somebody else did it. But he did it himself several times in uh, the, you know, the complete Kabbalah of Alistair Crowley. He has four or five different ways in which he can get his name to add up to 666. Alistair E. Crowley, one way and Alexander Crowley, which was his birth name, another way. And he got to end up six, six, uh, several different ways, including creating a magical, 
name for himself, told, told Michael Varian, which adds up to 666 in Greek, and means the great beast. The 666 appears as a number of evil in the book of Revelations of St. John, who apparently ate too many funny mushrooms uh, on Patmos and had a lot of weird visions. Uh, it sounds like he got into the wrong kind of mushrooms as far as, well anyway, be that as it may, it's the number of the sun, capitalistically, and, uh, and this came up in one, in one of Crowley's numerous appearances in court, uh, the prosecutor asked him, do you not use the number 666? Is this not a number of evil? And Crowley says, no, well, it just means the sun, if you want to, you can call me sunny boy. <laughs> Anyway, 666 does symbolize the sun, and uh, as uh, John Michel in his book, The View Over Atlantis, points out, it appears in a lot of Christian architecture. There was a Gnostic underground tradition that recognized the positive meaning of the sun archetype. And Jungian terms, Crowley uh, identified with what Jung calls the solar phallic archetype. which I think is clear enough and doesn't require, <laughs> yeah, all you got to do is open a few pages of Crowley and you get the solar and phallic energy coming at you <laughs> right away. You don't even have to read Jung to find out what solar phallic means. Masonry, Rosicrucianism, Alchemy, Kabbalah, all related in a variety of ways, but disentangling them and explaining the historical uh, connections and how it all happened is almost impossible because no two authorities agree and uh, there is, like I said, everything disappears into fog eventually. I decided, one of the, one point I decided uh, that uh, the, uh, the masonry in the 18th century, which we, uh, we know it existed then, there's a lot of debate how much greater back we can trace it. I'm inclined to accept some of the evidence that we trace it back to the 17th century. And then it gets more and more debatable, but anyway, it was there in the 18th century. And I figured out the 32 degrees and the 33rd at the top of being honorary. Um, it corresponds to the Tree of Life well enough that there must have been Kabbalists in on the creation of Masonry. And probably there were, there were lots of other Masonic Kabbalistic elements in Masonry, but the 32 degrees weren't invented until Albert Pike in the 19th century, who was a Kabbalist, and he put a lot more Kabbalah in Masonry. So there was some Kabbalah in Masonry from the beginning, and then more got put in by Albert Pike. Poetic thought, uh, which was a combination of Gnosticism, Kabbalah, and alchemy had an underground existence in Europe for about a thousand years. Every time the Inquisition discovered any of it, they arrested everybody and burned them at the stake. But it still went on as an underground force, and it used various fronts, and among these fronts were the Rosicrucian movement and later Masonry. Then later, still in the 18th century, Masonry got taken over by, I think, I've been studying this a long time, so I have a right to an opinion, even though I, I, it's only an opinion, I can't claim to have the absolute truth. In the 18th century, it got taken over by a rationalistic group who wanted, who used masonry chiefly as a way of trying to end the religious wars that were tearing Europe apart and to establish the modern kind of democratic state in which there is no established religion. You might say the most enduring product of Freemasonry is the First Amendment to the American Constitution, which says Congress shall establish no religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof, which leaves it up to everybody to decide what religion they want and doesn't allow anybody to go out with an army and try to destroy somebody else's religion. That is what Masonry mainly was involved in throughout the 18th century, and they finally succeeded by 
the early 19th century, that was the generally accepted idea of civilized countries. You still find the older idea that the true religion should destroy all the false ones in backward and barbarous places like the Mideast or Northern Ireland. But in the civilized world, masonry has triumphed. Uh, that is to say, you can go, if you have the time and the patience, it doesn't take long. You can hunt around, use bookstores, and you can find enough books on the secrets of masonry revealed to find out what's going on. But if you're going through the initiations, it's better not to know. It's better if you... Uh, well, you, you, never re you never recapture the thrill of seeing Indiana Jones uh, in the Temple of Doom or whatever the hell. You, you never recapture the thrill on the second or the third viewing, right? It's better to be surprised. And it's better to be surprised in magic rituals than to know what's coming. <laughs>